Okay, so like I said, so today will be cubicle type theory and mainly cubicle agda. Um, and uh, right, so like the central type that you've been studying this week uh, and the type we're all studying in, in HOT is the identity type uh, of Pam Martin Lowe, uh, which you in agda can define like this. You just like write this kind of data declaration and then uh, uh, yeah, the name of the, the type. Um, so it's a type family like this and uh, we love to study it. And as we've all seen, so this is crucial to express various things like uh, um, equations one plus one equals two or specifications. So if you define addition of natural numbers, you can prove it's uh, commutative and so on. So it's really a kind of a crucial uh, type in, uh, in um, yeah, formalization of mathematics and computer science, right? Uh, and as you've seen, so some of these are provable by, by refl, like the first one should probably be provable by refl, depending on how you set things up, uh, but the others are not. And then you uh, uh, use the induction principle J, uh, which you've seen and worked with during the week. Uh, but today we're going to see kind of a completely different uh, way of doing things, uh, which is this cubicle way. So we're going to throw out this, this inductively defined identity type and throw in uh, what we call the path type. And then uh, suddenly um, you end up not proving things uh, using J, but rather using other primitives. Okay. So, right. So like before hot, I don't know uh, when the hot started, but uh, yeah, I don't know, before 2010 or something, maybe um, we had this problem that this equality that you define is not extensional enough um, in the sense that you cannot prove things like functional extensionality. So uh, in Agda notation, you write it like this. You have a constant fun x, the, and then you write the, the, the type like this. Um, so you don't write any for all or anything, uh, but you just write like curly braces and, and normal parentheses um, um, for, the, for the pi types. Um, and curly braces denote the uh, implicit arguments and uh, normal parentheses denote non-implicit arguments. Okay, so anyway, so before hot, we couldn't really fill this hole without assuming it as an axiom, um, which um, has some negative consequences. And uh, there were other problems people had. You can't prove uh, proposition extensionality or more generally univalence. Uh, um, and maybe even more problematic is the fact that you can't really reason about quotient types nicely uh, in pre-hot type theory. Um, and as we all know, quotients are used, uh, you know, everywhere in mathematics. This is how you typically define rational numbers and everything else, uh, like a lot of other things. And it's kind of, um, yeah, so kind of to circumvent this, this problems, people had a lot of tricks and clever encodings and stuff to kind of not uh, have to do things like quotients as quotients, but do things more directly. Um, but uh, now with hot, uh, you don't really have this problem because you can define quotients um, either as a higher inductive type or using some other encoding. Um, okay, so that's what we're gonna see today. Um, so what host does is uh, essentially adding all of these things like axioms and as we so yesterday, this is justified by the simplicial set model of Wolski. Um, so this justifies univalence, but then people later also established that it justifies uh, adding higher inductive types like quotients and so on. Um, so we can just throw them in as axioms to type theory. Um, and then we have somehow solved this problem with things not being extensional enough, uh, but this then breaks canonicity, which is this uh, very useful property of type theory. So uh, essentially that, um, if you have a type of uh, an element of, of the natural numbers, we know that it should reduce to a numeral. So uh, whatever whatever complicated term we write, we know that it should in principle be able to reduce to a numeral. But once you start throwing in axioms, um, this breaks. So uh, you can pretty easily construct um, examples of, of numbers that don't reduce to numerals in hot. Um, so this is kind of sad from a type theoretic point of view and it's also Kind of annoying when you formalize things uh, because things don't reduce. So things that should hold by refl don't hold by refl and so on. 
Um, so people then worked on this cubicle um, type theories, um, which essentially fixes these problems by extending type theory, not with axioms, but rather with new primitives, uh, uh, which I'll show today. Um, and these primitives then make things like funnext or univalence provable. So uh, they have computational content. They, they are not added as axioms, but rather they are like any other term you would write down in the theory. Um, okay, and these cubicle models, like we saw, uh, cubicle type theories are, like we saw yesterday, inspired by these cubicle models. Um, okay, and then this then preserves canonicity. Um, so you can prove that all of these extensions that we throw into our type theory still um, gives us a good type theory in the sense that it uh, has canonicity. And recently, uh, Caroline, Julie, and uh, John Sterling proved that you also have a form of normalization um, for this kind of type theory or a variation of this kind of type theory. So uh, you get kind of all of the good properties you want without, uh, um, yeah, in a, in a proper type theory with, uh, which is also extensional in the sense that you have fun X and univalence and quotients. Can I uh, mention that you have a weaker version of canonicity that does in fact hold, right? So you, you can prove things up to propositional equality still. Yes, for hot, yes. Uh, yeah, this, this was established uh, recently or one or two years ago by Christian Suttler and uh, Chris Kapulkin. And they proved this kind of homotopy canonicity. So uh, whatever term you write down in, in hot, let's say uh, you uh, of, of type natural number is, um, yeah, not definitionally equal to a number, um, but uh, so whatever closed term you write down of this type, it's not definitionally equal, but it's equal up to a path or up to a identification to the identity type. So uh, that's nice. So that kind of um, establishes kind of a weak form of constructivity for hot. But uh, when you actually formalize things in a proof assistant, it's very nice to prove things by refl. Um, and in hot, you can often not do that because uh, uh, things only hold uh, up to a path and not, not definitionally. Um, yep, so that's a good, good point. Uh, maybe, yes, thanks for um, reminding me to say that. Okay, so, so what is this idea then in cubicle type theory? So like I said uh, a few minutes ago, so the idea is to, we throw out this inductively defined uh, equality type and instead uh, we throw in what we call paths. Uh, so this is kind of taking the hot intuition very, very literally. So we don't start with an inductively defined uh, equality type, but rather we define it uh, as a type of paths. So what is a path? So a path, it's just a function like you would do in uh, topology or, or analysis or whatever, um, like normal function out of some interval type, which I write uh, I um, for the interval. Um, so a path in a type A is just such a function, um, such that if you apply it to the left on point of the interval, so which we call I zero for interval zero, it's this green I zero here cubicle like that, then it definitionally reduces to x. And if you apply it to the right hand point, it definitely reduces to y. And here I'm uh, using kind of Agda notation for, for equality, which might be a bit confusing. So let me emphasize. So this, this blue triple bar, that's really the, the weak, uh, the path equality, while I use the normal equality symbol for definition of equality or judgmental equality. Okay. So uh, we're all on the same page, but these equality symbols mean. Right, so that's what a path is. So we throw this in, and then by kind of iterating this, you get, uh, so if you kind of map out of two uh, interval, yeah, uh, out of I squared, you get a square. If you map out of I cube, you get a cube and so on. So then the type theory becomes inherently um, cubical because you can just like write down these cubes in your types uh, as, normal functions and not as iterated identity types. Okay, um, so this adds some more stuff, which we'll see today, uh, gives us fun X, univalence, quotients, and all that without sacrificing canonicity, uh, like I said on the previous slide. And uh, so this kind of simple idea of just throwing out the equality, the inductively defined uh, identity type and throwing in this new path equality is 
really the core idea. So if there's one thing you should take home from this course, it's this is what we do. We throw out the inductively defined equality type and we throw in the path type defined as in you would in topology or, or analysis. And then maybe I should emphasize that this I here is really, um, so it's not like, we, not like we're throwing in all the real numbers and take the take the real interval. This is like an abstract uh, representation of the interval. Um, but but the intuition is still very kind of uh, real, so to say. Uh, okay, good, 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 good. All right. Um, yes. So let me just quickly say a few things about cubic lagda now. So cubic lagda was implemented by Andrea Vesosi, building on a series of experimental type checkers that we wrote the Chalmers so over the years, cubicle and cubicle TT and some other variations of those. Um, and I should also say that there are many other cubicle systems than cubicle lagda, so aren't we saw yesterday. And then there's a whole series of, of uh, colorful proof assistants coming out of CMU, so red, polar, red TT and cool TT. And these are based on other variations of, of cubicle type theory. Uh, and then there are a few more um, developed by myself and other people. Okay, and yeah, so all of these build on various cubicle models um, and uh, various cubicle type theories. Um, and the version that cubicle lagda is based on is this CCHM um, or the Swedish version of cubicle type theory, um, which we wrote the paper about in 2015. Um, okay. So I'm just the question yes. about the interval. So uh, if I recall correctly, it's not a type. So exactly. it doesn't live in the universe, but it's still kind of a type in that it has elements that you can play around with, right? Yeah, exactly. So you can map out of it, but you can't really, so you can't map out of it, but it's not inductively defined. So you can't pattern match on it so to start with. And you can't also, uh, well, I guess you, okay, yeah. So it's not like an inductively defined, like it's not like the higher inductive interval, for example, it's really a different thing. And it's not the type, uh, so it doesn't live like in the normal universe, it lives in another universe, uh, but it's a bit, yeah, this kind of technical detail. So when you, when you program, you usually don't run into these kind of things, but yeah, it's good to know that the interval, it's not, not like a normal type that we throw in, but something slightly different. And if I remember, uh, I'll tell you exactly why later. Okay, good. Okay, so right, so this cubicle mode, so Andrea added it quite a few years ago now, well, two years ago, uh, it was merged into main Agda. So now you can just open an Agda file and start with a little flag and then you're in the cubicle world. Uh, and uh, yeah, a bit before that, Andrea and I started writing this library, uh, Agda slash cubicle. Uh, which is really what you should use if you want to play around with cubicle like that, because it's kind of it's it sets things up the way you want, um, or the way you need to use cubicle like that, and then it has lots and lots of things proved for you, um, so you don't have to start from scratch, and you can kind of use uh, kind of the, the the interface that the library provides. You can use without uh, looking too much under the hood. Uh, which is very nice because cubicle type theory is a bit complicated. But uh, as a user using cubic, this like the cubicle library, um, you don't really have to know all the all, all the stuff going on under the hood uh, anymore. So that's nice. And yeah, we have uh, quite a few contributors by now and uh, quite a lot of code. So it's growing um, a lot. All right. So um, yes. So let me just jump to Agda. I see I'm already out of the going slower than I thought, but uh, that's okay. All right. So now I switch window. I'm now in Agda um, and I have added this minus minus cubicle flag. And if I press control C, control L, uh, yeah, you saw it, it flashed very quickly, which means uh, it loaded the file very quickly because the file is empty. Um, essentially empty. So I just like open with a few comments and then say that this is the part one module. So, yeah. Okay. Um, right. So, yeah. So if you read, so I, I, can, I wrote the notes as detailed as I could. Um, so if you never used Agda and don't know what key bindings I press, I think most of the commands are documented in the notes. Um, 
so, so Agda is quite different from COC uh, in the sense that most of the interaction with the system happens by pressing various key bindings or so combinations of, of keys uh, in Emacs, and then cool stuff happens. While in COC, you just write some tactics and press, press one or two uh, commands. But in Agda, you need to know a bit, uh, a few, yeah, quite a few more like key bindings. But once you get the hang of it, it's uh, really fun. So I guess I should also say, so Agda is very different from Cock in the sense that they, there are no uh, tactics, really. Well, there are, but uh, most of the, the programming you do in Agda, you don't do with tactics. Um, I never use tactics in Agda. So, uh, and then you might wonder, well, how do you prove something? Well, uh, that's what we're going to see. Um, all right. So just to get started, I have to import one file. So, okay. So this, uh, so this cubicle, that's the that's the library I talked about, and in the core of the library, there's some file called primitives, uh, which I import and I make it public. So that's just that kind of sets all the cubicle stuff up for me, uh, which is not the stuff that is not done by the minus minus cubicle flag is done by this file, and you can click on it if you want and uh, look at it. But let's not do that now because we just confuse everyone. Okay. Um, yes. So, so one, another difference between uh, Agda and Coq is that you need uh, to write universe levels everywhere in Agda, which is both a blessing and a curse. Um, so I'm just gonna assume a bunch of them and say a few words about it. So the variable keyword is just like section variables or whatever in Coq. You just assume a bunch of variables uh, in the file and uh, Maybe you saw very quickly. I like if I press backslash uh, Emacs. So the Agda mode of Emacs lets me type in uh, essentially whatever uh, cool characters I want. So let's say I want a, an alpha. I write alpha, and suddenly I have an alpha. So that's quite nice. So so cool. so Agda has support for arbitrary. Uh, uh, well, not arbitrary, but a lot of Unicode symbols. Okay. So, right, so, uh, and I, of course, have a typo, first thing I do. Uh, so I assume some universe levels. So these are just like levels for the universes. Um, if you don't know what the universe level is, don't worry about it, it will be clear still. So. Okay, uh, so let me just quickly show you how you write the function. So we, we saw uh, one on uh, the, the phonics slide, but what you do is, uh, like, so you write it in this kind of Haskell style notation. So you don't write like definition, blah, 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 but you, you just write the name and then the type comes after the colon and then the definition comes after that. Um, and the definition is written like this kind of equation. So it X equals X. Um, yeah, and like I said before, so things within curly braces are uh, implicit arguments and if I would have written this with a normal braces, I would have to give the A here as a parameter. Okay, but let's leave it like that. Okay. So you see, I kind of, I type things in, then I press control C, control C, control L very fast all the time. And then uh, the buffer reloads. Um, so it's not like in, in Coq where you step through the file, but rather you load the whole file in one go by pressing this command. Okay. Mm. Yeah. And we can also write this as a lambda because it's a, it's a function type. So the inhabitants are, are lambdas, right? And not too surprising. And then I'm just going to show one more Agda thing. And then we've had our Agda crash course. Uh, so if you put a question mark and reload the file, you get one of these blue holes. So if you put the cursor in there and press control C comma, you see, uh, you see, uh, yeah, what you have to produce. So we have to produce something of type A R O A uh, under the assumption that A is a type and L is a level. And, uh, so this is kind of how you interactively 
interact with Agda. So it looks a bit different from Cork. You don't step through a tactic script, but rather you write these holes and then uh, uh, things are displayed, I think, upside down compared to Cork. Like in Cork, you get the assumptions first and then the conclusion below, but here it's the other way around, but whatever. Um, okay, so this is how you interact with Agda. And then if you press Control C, Control R, uh, Agda writes code for you. So then it's kind of, because we were producing, uh, so Agda wanted a function type. So it knows we wanted to use a Lambda. So I press Control C, Control R. This is one of the most useful commands, refine. Um, and it's a bit like refining Cock, um, but it's just a key binding. And then, well, press C, Control Comma. Now, suddenly the goal has changed. We now want an A. And we have an X in the context of type A. So I just put X there and press Control C, Control Space. And then the goal is finished and we can reload and Agda is happy. Okay, so that was very fast uh, how you interact with Agda. For those who haven't seen Agda ever before, this is what is gonna happen now. Uh, so uh, now Q with Agda. Like I said, so I, uh, it's the interval pre-type. So we call a pre-type is one of these things that is almost a type, but not really. And I will explain what it means in a minute. And it has these two endpoints, uh, I0 and I1 with endpoints. Okay. Uh, so let me just show you how we can use it to do something. Okay, so um, here we go. So assuming that I have one of these functions out of the interval into A, um, I can produce an A either by applying this P to I0 or I1. And as you see in the name, uh, I'm probably gonna apply it to I0. So then I can reload. And if I do control C dot, it shows me what type, what the type is uh, of the thing I punched in. Um, and it's an A, so we can provide it to Agda. Okay. Um, so you see, so this like, so the, the functions out of the interval like this are just normal functions. Um, the I behaves more or less like a normal type with two inhabitants, more or less. Um, and we just apply things by, by writing a space like we do in, in functional programming. Okay. Um, yep. So now, um, so now we also have, uh, so like I said, the equality uh, is not uh, inductively defined, but rather in terms of this kind of function type out of the interval. Oh, yeah, let's not call it B. Um, okay, and uh, so let me just give you a first little path. So let's say we have an X in A and we want to produce a path from X to X or an equality uh, X equals X. How do we do this? Uh, so like I said, this, this equality type is really built out of this function type. Um, so if we ask Agda to refine the goal for us, Agda will give us a nice um, Lambda abstraction. We're just abstracting over an I and this I is an element of the interval. And then we get to see some other um, junk down here, which uh, one can typically ignore unless one is doing uh, advanced stuff. So uh, for now, just read like this part of the goal and the constraints you can ignore. Um, okay. So now we want to produce an X, uh, an A, and I just said what we want to do. We put in X and bam. So now we have produced um, a function out of the interval, which when applied to I0 gives us X and when applied to I1 gives us X, which is exactly what we wanted. So uh, cool. Uh, yes. 
let me now just very quickly copy paste this and show you one more kind of things. Let me first of all rename it to REFL um, because this is a proof of reflexivity. Um, and I'm going to make the X implicit because that's convenient. And then I'm just going to show you. So, how, so when we have a, like an, uh, let me just do it like this. So when we have an implicit X here, um, it's not in scope in the goal. So how do we access it? Well, we write curly braces x equals x, which looks very strange. Um, but to, so if I now ask, now suddenly this x is in scope. So we can use it in the right-hand side. Uh, if I would have called this x equals y, then suddenly uh, we renamed the x in the kind of the right-hand side. Uh, or the conclusion with y. So that's really what's happening, but I don't want to rename anything. I just call it x. And this lets us access the x. Uh, oops. Oh, sorry. OK, uh, in the right hand side. OK, so you'll see this pop up a few more times uh, in the course today. So I figured out I'll, I'll show it straight up this strange uh, angle notation. Yes. How am I doing on time? Okay, reasonably well. Um, all right, so that was uh, that. Oh, and I'm already lost in my notes. Sorry. This is the problem uh, with notes. Okay. So uh, yeah, so as you see, it gets kind of tiring writing this a colon type L all the time. So I'm going to assume them as variables in the rest of the file. And I was gonna we have a, a question yeah. in the chat about the equality. So is it defined as the uh, function type from the interval? Yes. Or, yeah, OK. But, but with a side condition, like when Agda type checks this, uh, so you, you, Agda wants to type check that this term has this type, right? Then we have a side condition. So it's, first of all, it has to check that it's a function out of the interval into the type we want. And because you want to produce an equality in A, uh, it checks that we produce something of type A. Um, but it also checks that the, the left and the right endpoint match up definitionally. Um, so in this case, it's kind of trivially true because we only have X, oh, sorry, we only have X around. Um, but let's say I had. Okay, now I'm going to do, uh, uh, okay, let's, let's change this guy. Uh, so let's say here I wanted to produce, I also had a Y in the context, uh, or as an assumption. Um, and then I would write Y here. Then Agda would be upset with me because not just, uh, so we, yeah, so we don't just have to produce a term of type I arrow A, but there's also uh, this side condition that when you apply whatever we have here to I zero, it should reduce definitionally to this and to I want to this. So uh, so there is more going on than just like introducing a, a function type here. Okay, good. Yeah, so that can be a bit confusing when before you get used to it. Uh, but then uh, once you're used to it, uh, it's very natural, I guess. Okay, so let me, um, yeah, okay. I guess I should say one more thing. So, so this equality, Type is not inductively defined, but it's rather this built-in uh, uh, thing with a, a function and two uh, equations that it has to satisfy. Um, so because of that, we have to define REFL. Uh, we also have to prove path induction, which we're going to do uh, if we have time. And uh, but like, so what we do when we work cubically is typically we don't like define path induction or J and then prove everything from that. But rather we, we use the fact that this is actually almost just a function. Um, and this lets us do a lot of cool stuff uh, easily. So let me define Kong, uh, also known as app. I think it's app in the hotbook, but uh, in Sweden we call it Kong. Okay, so let's say I have a function from A to B and to implicit X and Y in A and proof that x is equal to y, then I can get the proof that uh, f of x is equal to f of y. Oops, should be a question mark. All right. So in like, yeah, in hot or normal type theory, you would prove this by, by 
path induction or J, but we don't have path induction or J here, uh, but that's not really a problem because uh, this is just a function. So what do we wanna do? So we wanna define something in the equality type, in the path type. So we abstract over an I um, in the interval. And then if we then take, so our P is a path from X to Y and we can just apply it to this I. That gives us an element of A. This is what uh, Agda tells us. And well, we have a function from A to B, so we can just apply it to this element. And then uh, we type check and bam, we've proved it in uh, not too much code. And I can just move this on the right hand side. So Kong is really just composing the function f with this path. Um, and that's very nice. So for those of you who looked at this warm up file that I have, uh, many things hold by by refl, which don't hold by refl in, uh, in uh, hot. Um, so uh, check out the warm up file uh, for cool uh, definition of equalities. Okay, so uh, that's nice. Um, so essentially, so if, if this f is the identity function, this is definitionally the identity function. And if it's the composite of two functions, it's definition the composite of two cogs and so on. And that's very useful, um, something you don't get when you find this by, by path induction in hot. Okay, uh, very good. Uh, yes, so I think I'm very quickly just looking at what more I want to say. Yeah, I want to say a lot more. As always, I one prepares far too much, but uh, that's okay. Um, all right, so, so let me now uh, show you another cool thing we can prove. Um, so uh, phonics, so given an equality, uh, yeah, for all X in A, F of X is equal to F of G of X, <laughs> then uh, the functions are equal. So this is the thing I said wasn't provable in, uh, in uh, standard type theory and in hot, we typically prove it from univalence using a kind of a complicated proof due to Vovodsky. Uh, but here, as we will very soon see, it has um, a quite trivial proof uh, when you think of paths as just being functions. So, all right, so we have P and once again, we want to produce uh, a path. So I press control C, control R and now uh, so refine and Agda is very like eager. It introduces as many assumptions as it can, like as many things as possible gets lambda extracted, which can get confusing. So I think uh, Gabriel Scherer was complaining about this uh, on the chat earlier today uh, on Discord. But uh, yeah, but in this case, this is actually what we want. So what happens? So this thing here is just a function out of the interval uh, into kind of an equality of, of of functions, so so we just yeah have to abstract over an i and then over an x and produce a b. Um, that's what we want to do. And well, we have this p. So if you apply p to x, we get a path from f of x uh, to g of x. That's what the hypothesis says. And then if I just put i here, uh, we get something in b. And uh, this type checks magically. Let me rewrite it so that it's more readable maybe. So what the hell happened? I proved Funex in uh, what, three characters? Uh, no, uh, five characters if you count to spaces. So what is going on? So this thing is a uh, path of functions. Uh, so we can, well, this thing is a, uh, yeah, okay. So we want to, so if you apply this x, uh, this p to x, we get an equality between f of x and g of x. Um, and then uh, we apply it to the i. So if you look at like fun x p i zero of x, this is p x i zero, right? Uh, then let me just reduce this. So, so what is p 
px, that's just f of x is equal to g of x. And then if you look at, uh, oops, now my uh, timer told me to hurry up. So if you just look at the left end point of this, it's just f of x. Um, and uh, yeah, that's essentially what we wanted. Okay. So if you write out the uh, equality as a function, you're basically just swapping the arguments. Exactly. So, oh, okay. so the nice thing here is, so, so what's the computational content of fun next? Well, it's essentially just swap the arguments or, or flip, um, um, like it's called in, in Haskell. So um, someone was asking about this in the, on Discord earlier today. So this means that kind of these two types, uh, you can map between them by just swapping the arguments and the composite is definitionally REFL. So that's also really nice. It's kind of a very uh, strong isomorphism between these two types uh, or very strict isomorphism. So that's very cool. Um, yep. So that's fun next. All right. And I'm just going to skip over. Let me just very quickly play. Uh, So we have extra structure on i. So we have like a, oops. Uh, min operation and a max operation and a symmetry operation. But I'm not going to talk about this now, but you can read about them in the notes uh, because uh, I don't really have the time to do it now. Because um, I wanted to show you very something about equality and sigma types because that's also uh, nice in cubicle type theory so something you probably have noticed is that equality and sigma types uh, is very annoying that's probably the most annoying thing in type theory if you ask me um, and the reason is that well, because it's kind of a dependent pair. So when you want to prove that two elements of this dependent pair are equal, you first have to prove that the first components are equal. And then you need to prove that the second components are equal over the proof that you gave that the first components were equal. And this uh, is a source of uh, uh, a lot of headache um, for many people, including myself. Uh, uh, but one thing that... Uh, uh, cubicle type theory does is that it gives you kind of a new and nicer way, I would say, of reasoning about the quality and sigma types, which uh, simplifies many things. So you don't end up in uh, this transport hell, uh, which you do when you reason about the quality and sigma types in hot or, or normal type theory. So I figured I'd show that quickly because that pops up in one of the exercises. Um, but I'm skipping on a large chunk of my notes first. Um, okay, so um, so to talk about this, uh, I first have to talk briefly about uh, path P, which is path over paths. Uh, so in hot, uh, there's this notion of a path over, um, which is like you have a path uh, between two things, which kind of varies over another path. Um, and in cubicle type theory, this is a built-in notion. Um, and where was the thing I wanted to say? I'm skipping too far ahead in my notes because uh, I have too much to say. Mm, nope. One second, sorry. Yeah, okay, so so uh, another primitive, this is path P, uh, A, X, Y. Uh, so, uh, so here I assume that we have A is a line of types or uh, yeah, a function out of the interval into the universe of types. And x is an element at, at a i zero, and y is an element at a i one. So, uh, uh, in fact, uh, x equals y uh, is short for path p. So, 
So what I've been saying so far is that this that this equality uh, type or this path type is the primitive. I've been lying a little bit because the real primitive is path P. And that's really what makes equality in sigma types uh, nice uh, in cubicle type theory. So let me just uh, show you this so you do you believe me. So if you have refl, let me define refl p, uh, which is just equal to refl. And what did I say? This thing is equal to this. So I'm just going to paste it in and write uh, x x there. And it type checks. So uh, now you believe me that uh, x equals x, um, path equal x, is the same as this kind of path p thing. Uh, so the real primitive is path p, uh, which is kind of heterogeneous notion of path. So it's a path over another path of types, essentially. And that's uh, super useful uh, because it lets us uh, reason about uh, equality and sigma types nicely. So let me uh, do that very quickly here. So here I'm going to show you yet another Agda trick. I think I'm over time already, but it's OK. So, um, so I want to characterize the equality between x and y in sigma a, b. So I, I do that using a module like this, which is kind of an Agda way of starting a section and having some section variables like which are not global in the whole file okay so you just, you just do an anonymous module like this and you just write the parameters to the module and then they then they will be parameters to whatever functions you write later so so what did i say okay so let's say we want to prove uh, that x is equal to y Okay, so what, what do we have to assume? So normally you have to assume that you have an, a path between first of X and first of Y. And then if you transport Y uh, along this equality, uh, X along this equality, you get Y. But cubically you can do something else. So, uh, so I said, Okay, so this is what Agda looks like when you input incomplete terms, everything turn yellow, but don't worry about it. So here's the notation for sigma types in the cubicle library. So you write sigma square brackets, whatever in uh, some type. So here the type is just the type of proofs that uh, first x is equal to first y. And then I want to fill this. So here I can use refine. Uh, and rename a bit. So here we want an equality between second x and second y, right, over the equality uh, that we already assume that we have um, in the sigma type. So this we can write nicely as BPI. Okay. Um, so this is kind of the way you, you prove an equality of sigma types. Typically, uh, you don't do some transport stuff, you rather uh, first you prove the equality to, 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 between the first components, and then you construct one of these path P's. And path P's, like you work with it the same way you work with uh, the path type, this uh, triple equality type. Uh, but um, yeah. So let me quickly prove this uh, because you'll see. And so we start, start off with. Uh, uh, yeah, what should we call this? Uh, PQ maybe for the first argument. Uh, and then we want to uh, assume some i because we're constructing a path. So now we want to construct something in a sigma type uh, with certain boundaries. When i is zero, it has to be x. When i is one, it has to be y. So Agda helps us a bit constructing this, this path. And well, we're constructing a sigma type, so we just have to make a pair of things. Um, so I just write control CR, which gives us a comma, which is the constructor for sigma types in Agda. And then as first argument, I write just um, first P I, uh, PQ. And okay, sorry, I'm gonna show you one more thing. If you do this and you press CC, you get 
uh, Agda automatically destructs the argument, so it's like destructing cock. Okay, now I can read pi and q i. Boom. So can we uh, make a comment about uh, path overs here? So I mean, you haven't really avoided transport. I mean, it's kind of just giving it a different name, and in cubicle you can kind of treat it a bit more primitively, I guess, with these path p's. But this is exactly the same as have the you know the transport lemma. So the the right hand side would be a transport path, and then the left hand side is being transported over, right? Um, does mm, that make sense? Not exactly. So like, um, I haven't introduced transport yet. Um, no, but so I mean it's doing the same thing as transport. I mean you haven't called yes. it. Yes. Yeah. Well, but but like when I write. Uh, like uh, second, so transport, uh, I don't know, what do we call it? P second X equals second Y, right? Or whatever, where P is this first component. Um, this is really uh, like, this is a, what do you call it? Homogeneous path. So this is really in B of, uh, 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 the first y, right? Second y. No. <laughs> or no. So second is x is in B of first x, and we then we transport along the equality that first of x is equal to first of y, so we get something in B of first of y. The second y is in this type. So this is really like this equality here is not. Uh, not what you call it heterogeneous. Yeah, it's it's not between things in different types. Uh, so when like in hot, you're really just working with one type, uh, and that's what you do with the transport. While here we're really working with like the top, like the idea that this varies continuously uh, over this path. So there is a difference there. But and those can can you show them equivalent? Yes, uh, that's uh, an exercise. So like. So this big type is uh, equivalent to um, this thing, but they're really not like they're not definitionally the same. It's different things. You have to like the proof is more complicated than one might think. Uh, uh, so it's kind of. Yeah, so I think like this is one of the maybe a kind of a subtle point, but also very important in like this cubicle system is that the the path type is not uh, but it's really like heterogeneous. Yeah, heterogene I can't say this word, but you know, uh, equality between things in different types uh, is the primitive, and not uh, equality between things in the same type. And this is what makes, for example, higher inductive types much much easier uh, because. As you probably know, if you worked a bit with higher inductive types, uh, you kind of run into a lot of headache with app and dependent app and transport here and there just to like state uh, things like the eliminator and so on. And when you work cubically, you don't end up with, you don't get any of those problems because everything is expressed using this uh, path P instead of the normal path. And just to yeah. say something that was said in chat, so you think of functions as, uh, Sorry, if you think of paths as just functions from the interval, dependent paths are just seeming as dependent functions from the interval, right? Yeah, exactly. No. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Thanks. Whoever said that, uh, good. Yeah, so it's kind of a subtle difference, uh, which is uh, kind of important and what makes uh, many things work much nicer cubically than in hot, I would say. So, uh, yeah. Okay. So I had a lot more prepared as always, but I think I've uh, covered what I really needed um, for the exercises. So I'm going to let you work on that.